I recently had a card pop through my letterbox by Andrew White and Tristan Cooper, and they included a £10 voucher in it for the local supermarket, so thanks for that, guys. Um, and I actually used it. They suggested I could buy a beer with it. I didn't. I ended up buying some LED lights with it instead. And here they are. It's Boko 100 Red LED lights, and what really got my interest here was, because it was a sealed box and I couldn't really just... I didn't want to start opening the, the shop... It was quoting the, you know, the usual arrangement of the 30 volt, the 31 volt power supply um, and, uh, you know, saying that LEDs are 3.2 volt. It made me wonder, are they now switching away from using the older Gary Marsonide LEDs in maybe longer series configurations or a different voltage transformer and starting to use the gallium nitride ones instead since it means that they get a consistent, they get a fairly pastel shade of red, it's a richer red, and um, they... Uh, have the same forward voltage as all the other LEDs, like the, the phosphor yellows and the standard greens and blues. And uh, the only way to find out was to buy a set, and here it is, and it turns out they are phosphor-based LEDs with the gallium nitride chips. So when plugged in, they create uh, that sort of... It's an unusual red. It's a red with that just the slightest smidgen of blue in the background, which uh, I guess ultimately that's because the blue is being used to stimulate the chips. So... In the long term, I would expect traditional red probably would outlast these ones because the phosphor will degrade. But if the phosphor degrades, it's probably going to start shifting towards the blue. So that would be quite interesting in its own right. However, now we've ascertained that they are using phosphor-based red LEDs, uh, it also comes with the Jutai power supply. And it's just the standard, simple Jutai power supply. And in the past, I've opened some of the more sophisticated ones with the programmable functions on them. And um, I just wondered, have they changed? So the only way to find out is to try and pop this open, and it's so well sealed. I may have to get to the Dremel into this, but let's try the grips first of the grips of in inquisitiveness. So let's uh, see if we can gently crack this open. Uh, not cracking the circuit board inside, which I did previously. I'm not sure how... Let's uh, notch these down a bit. I don't want to squeeze too tightly because in the past I have squeezed a similar power supply and then squashed the circuit board inside and then had to repair it. So I think I'm going to have to Dremel this open. So rather than uh, torture your ears with the sound of the Dremel, I shall pause momentarily while I do that. So that's it open, and uh, I didn't realise this before. I, I dremeled down the sides and tried splitting it apart, but the actual way it comes open is that this end cap just pops off, but it is kind of glued and sort of clipped in place. And it's interesting that there's another safety feature to do with that, that if it comes off accidentally, it will disconnect everything automatically, and I'll show you that afterwards. But let's plug it in as it is. Um, let's unplug the lights... Uh, plug it in as it is and measure the open circuit voltage output from this. I have dremeled one of the capacitors slightly, so this may go a bit volatile. We'll see what happens. So let's get the meter in, set it to DC volts. About 200 volt range here, because uh, I'm expecting the voltage in this to be about... Um, about 31 volts, it says. 31 point... Uh, what is it? It says... It says 31 volts, so let's see how close it gets to it, because this uh, is using uh, primary side sensing. 30.7, I mean, that is pretty accurate, is it not? 30.7, that is really accurate. Now, what happens, and I'll just, uh, I'm going to unplug it, and I'm going to short it deliberately. And to do the short circuit, I, I've already tried this, by the way, so I know that I can do it in the low current setting range. If I use the wee dinky meter because it's got these uh, crock clips supplied already, I shall uh, just clip this on here and clip this on here. And it's got a very controlled short circuit uh, behaviour. So that should be it short circuited now. Let's see what happens. It pulses, the uh, current goes down and then it pulses again. So it's just every so often it's just chapping to see if the, um, the fault's cleared yet. I would guess it's got current limiting too. Uh, it seems to include that as a standard feature in the design. So, turn that off, stick it out of the way. As I was saying, if, you, if this somehow got pulled off, if the seal broke and it got pulled off, to make it safe, what actually happens is if this gets pulled off, 
the circuit board just pulls right out and it automatically disconnects. And there are electrical connections in the back there, but they're quite hard. You know, it's no worse than a lamp holder. You'd actually have to poke your finger in. And uh, I'm not sure a child could actually reach its finger up that far. So it's quite a safe design that way. The circuit board itself, uh, it, it does have filtering. It's got a fuse. It's got a uh, multiple layer, m multiple inductor filtering, and it's got a standard chip called a DP2525. Uh, I've already printed the data sheet off that and pictures of the circuit board. So let's start by taking a look at the chip. The chip is one of these typical uh, switch mode chips. It's a very common, it's a fairly cheap one. It's got the main transistor for switching here, um, the primary winding of the transformer. It's got the current sense where you put a resistor between that and the negative rail and it measures the voltage across that resistor so it knows how much current's flowing in the primary and that relates directly to what's actually happening in the secondary. And then it's got feedback for monitoring um, load via a feedback winding which also doubles up as the bootstrap winding which I'll also show you in a moment. And then it's got the uh, VDD input, the power supply input, which has various thresholds. It's got the uh, over-voltage protect and it's got under-voltage lockout. And the under-voltage lockout has two voltage thresholds, 18 volts and 6.5 volts. And when you initially power it up, it's got that slight delay that it charges the capacitor through a trickle resistor until it reaches the 18 volts. Then it tries to start running. And uh, if it doesn't succeed to run and the voltage keeps going down until it reaches about 6.5 volts, it'll cut off. Uh, and maybe, uh, I guess it'll try again. But... Um, if it does start running properly, uh, it will then power itself, and I'll show you that in the uh, schematic here. So in the case of the circuitry here, the schematic it shows the main command, it's got a bridge rectifier, it's got an uh, uh, electrolytic capacitor, then an inductor with a resistor across it, and another electrolytic capacitor for, that's just to provide a nice uh, smooth filtered DC. It's got the two resistors which trickle charge the power supply capacitor here. And once they reach that threshold voltage I was talking about, uh, then when this starts running, it then provides feedback via this diode, which will then charge that capacitor and the circuit will just run off its own generated power from the, that auxiliary winding. And that winding is also used via two resistors for feedback. There's the current sense resistor down here going to ground. And the other thing, the primary, is this uh, combination of a diode, capacitor and resistor. And they're to do with... Um, the uh, suppressing the transient spike when this transistor turns off. And one of the interesting things about this uh, circuit is that um, the transistor inside it is actually a bipolar junction transistor. It's not a MOSFET. I was expecting a MOSFET, but it does seem to be a traditional style of transistor, which makes it fairly rugged, actually, although they're usually quite a bit harder to drive. So, uh, pictures. I've flipped a picture here, so the text is all going to be wrong. Uh, just, but it correlates to the actual the placement of the components. So the mains comes in in these little metal uh, contacts, the ones that can pull off if uh, you know something goes wrong. It's these contacts here. There's a sleeved fuse. Let's uh, pull the sleeve off that fuse and see what's uh, underneath. Is it a fuse or is it a? I'm guessing it might be a glass fuse. I'm guessing it's not really wanting to liberate its, its sleeve either. Or it could be a resistor. It's a metal film resistor being used as a fusible resistor. So it's got a value of what looks like brown, black, black, 10 ohms. So it's the safety device of something, you know, most likely the chip in here would, would go dead short circuit and it would uh, blow that uh, re resistor in a controlled manner. Unlike the schematic which shows one inductor, uh, where is the schematic? Let's bring that back in. The schematic shows uh, the single inductor there. The actual uh, circuit also has a second inductor down here. They've just basically added another one. I'm not sure why they've done that. Maybe just to save the size, That maybe it was just easier to stick two smaller inductors in there. Roughly about uh, 2,200 2, micro Henry's. Uh, the capacitor is a 2.2 microfarad, 400 volt. This uh, little capacitor here is the power supply for the chip. It's uh, these pins here, and it's uh, charged via. Uh, let me let me just check. I've got this right. Uh, yes, I have. 
So it's charged from an auxiliary winding based on this, these two pins here uh, via this diode. And those are the two sense resistors that feed, provide feedback. Uh, that's the current sense resistor there. It's actually uh, 2.49 ohms. And I'm guessing they've used such an incredibly accurate one just so they can fine-tune the output voltage. Massive separation, by the way. Really, really huge separation. Uh, it's really well designed. Uh, and the transformer has that thing where it steps out. It's got the bit stepped out, and then it's got the sleeving, and it's got the multiple layers of... The, it's got the thick insulation underneath as well. So quite well designed that way. Um, these two resistors, uh, 1.5 meg ohm, two in series... Uh, also, they're the ones that slowly trickle charge. When you turn it on, there's a slight delay, and it's basically it's trickle charging this capacitor here until it's, the chip can run, and then it'll start generating its own power supply. We've got the Class Y1 capacitor. That, that's the one that gives you a tingle off your phone when it's charging. Um, well, actually, it's coupling through the windings, but also through this capacitor. Uh, we've got the rectifier diode and output. We've got the smoothing capacitor, the one I've dremeled slightly. I think I've gone right through the case there. I'm not sure... Um, and then there's a little load resistor. So fundamentally, it's pretty much textbook. It seems quite well designed. Uh, an odd quirk here. There is a resistor position here, but it's been shunted out. Um, likewise, there's there's a resistor position here that isn't occupied, but this one, I, I thought, it was quite an important resistor. It was the one to do with the, the uh, little uh, anti... this capacitor here, the one that protects the transistor and the chip from the back EMF spike from the primary winding. But um, they've got a resistor position, but it is just linked across underneath it, even though everything's there, including the little red dot of glue that's used to stick the components down for soldering. But yeah, this is neat. It's very neat inside. And now I know that uh, to get them open, you prise them off, though it does look like there is probably glue holding that as well. But uh, to open them, it really is just a case of prising that back cap off if you ever needed into them. I guess the same applies to the ones with the um, option buttons, the, the set ones that have the multi-functions. Multi so yeah, it's quite well designed. It's what I'd expect of a Jutai power supply. It's, they seem to be one of the biggest manufacturers of the Christmas lighting power supplies, and, and the stuff seems to be pretty good quality. The capacitors are called KYS, just I know some people want to know what the capacitors are called. And this, you know, everything about it looks like it's made to a, a high standard. So yeah, interesting. So um, in summary, the LEDs are the gallium nitride style LEDs, so they, they meet that 10 LEDs in series uh, to give the 30 volts output from this power supply. And the power supply is just good quality and well protected, so it's a good result all round.